Okay. Oh, sorry. Today we're talking about the questions. The questions. The questions. Notebook. Everybody has to have a notebook out. Please take all that stuff off your desk. Except for your notebook. All of this unnecessary bags and stuff. Take that stuff off your desk. Let's, uh, let's clear our desk so we can clear our minds so we can understand these questions. Because if you don't understand the question, you won't find the answer. Wouldn't you agree with that, Ms. Yara? You don't agree with that, Ms. Yara? Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's just common sense. If you don't understand the question, you won't find the answer. Miss Aya. Miss Aya. You ready? You ready? Come on, come on, come on. Open your notebook and, you know, let's get down to business here. Not the questions that you are prepared for today because I know you didn't come to class unprepared today. I just know I don't have to ask and everybody's ready today. But that's good. I'm glad that you're ready. But these are some other questions that we need to talk about. The seven types of questions we find on the reading section of the SAT. Seven types of questions. Now, I hope I had a chance to go over this before, in first quarter. If I didn't, that's okay, because we're going to be going over it this quarter, next quarter, and the next quarter. Because understanding the questions on the SAT is the beginning, the beginning of what we need to know. All right, so the seven question types are main idea questions, primary purpose, detail, inference, vocabulary questions, tone and mood, and evidence-based questions. I tell you, I have an idea. Instead of just writing a list, let's go over them one by one. We're going to go over them one by one, right? Okay, so before we begin, I would like to give you some advice. This is advice is coming from a tutor, namely me. I am a tutor. I do not tutor my students. I guess you know that already because for the first time, no one has asked me, and I'm like, yay. But I don't tutor my students, period. However... I, I will give you advice, and I have to say, unfortunately, when it comes to English, you won't find a good tutor. That's just how life is. I mean, it is what it is. You won't find a good tutor or one that can help you. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, why have you? you might, I mean, you might get a tutor just to feel good, maybe give you some confidence, be like a coach, but you won't find anybody that can help you. You're probably going to have to help yourself. However, if you do get one, I have some advice for you. Number one, it's a warning. Get rid of this person. Don't spend another lesson if they avoid or they try to avoid the reading section. You know, they only want to really talk about the, the writing section that's in the reading section. They don't want to focus on that the whole time. Then they don't, they don't want to deal with the reading passages or anything like that. Get rid of them, okay? Because that's not going to help you. Obviously, it's not going to help you. Does not explain the why. Especially with reading passages. Can't tell you why the answer is what it is. Can't not, and, the, and the why is not because that's what the answer is. No, I need you to help me un understand because I didn't see it. If you can't help you see it, then you need to get rid of him, her, him or her. They, did they not? Uh, did they just look at you? Oh, okay. All right. Okay, let's get let's get back focus. Sorry for losing the focus here. All right. Uh, okay. So next. <clears throat> 
does not have any idea about idioms and vocabulary. In other words, words, your vocabulary is better than the tutors. And as far as idioms, and those are those words and phrases that are put together by native speakers. No rules go with that. And they don't have any idea about idioms. Especially phrasal verbs and prepositional idioms. Those are the idioms where the preposition comes before the word. And you know phrasal verbs is where the preposition comes after the verb. And if, they have, if they're really weak on that, then get rid of them. If, if, okay, if they're better than you, maybe keep them. But if you're better than them, get rid of them. That does not teach his or her strategy first. They like to tap dance around all stuff that's not relevant and doesn't want to go into the, the actual strategies that they want you to apply while you're taking the test. There are strategies. There are SAT strategies that help you guess, that help you avoid certain things. If they don't go over that first, get rid of them. Because you need to know that first even before you start doing practice tests. I mean, it makes it sense. So that you can avoid, you know, certain obvious and common mistakes. Does not explain why the strategy is used. They say, just do this. But why? You need to understand why the strategy is what it is. It helps you to understand the strategy and it helps you to apply it. If they can't tell you the why, that meant that they just read the strategy somewhere where they don't understand it themselves and they're just telling you, just do, it, just do it. When you see this word, do this. You say, why? Nah, don't worry about it. Just do it. Huh? How do I know this? How do I know this? Because I know a few people. <laughs> Knows very little about the history of SAT, actually. They didn't take it. They didn't know anything about it until a year or two ago when they decided, hey, I can make some money off this. And uh, yeah, so what does SAT mean? Say, oh, it's, uh, anyway, can we get to the <laughs> Instead of asking me that, give me some tea. And I didn't know what about. So anyway, does not, and they don't know anything about the SAT. They haven't spent any time on the college board going through it thousands of, uh, of pages of literature to talk about the past and present situations with students taking the SAT. They don't know anything about that. Get rid of them. Does not understand why the SAT has changed, but that's okay. That's old stuff. Don't worry about that. It doesn't make any difference to you because the SAT is the SAT. And you never knew what it was when it was not the new SAT. N nobody here knows what the old SAT was. I mean, well, yeah, maybe you had some brothers and sisters who had to take it, but you didn't actually, like, you know, have to deal with it. All right, so forget about that last one. Let's get down to the business. Main idea questions. They test you on your ability to understand what the general idea of the passage is. The general idea of the passage or... A paragraph, because main ideas can apply to paragraphs and it, and it can apply to the passage as a whole. Now, when we're only talking about questions that deal with the passage as a whole, we're talking about questions on theme, theme questions. The main idea can apply to the passage and it can apply to paragraphs. So, understand that. Okay, you must read the entire passage to get these questions. And now, uh, let me give you some more advice. I'm going to give you advice as we go along here. If you have a tutor who tells you, and here's some of the strategies, okay? Even if he teaches you this strategy, get rid of it. Even if he do this as soon as he sit down, get rid of it. If he tells you, only read the first and last sentence of a paragraph, or only read the first and last paragraph of a passage, if he tells you, skip this part and that part, then you get rid of him or her. Because if it's a reading test and he's telling you not to read, you can use your own logic. You got brains. You can understand how, how much that's going to benefit you. And it's not going to benefit you a, a whole lot. So, must read the entire passage. Must consider everything you have read in the passage.
And if you don't read the entire passage, main idea questions that talk about the entire passage are going to be a bit difficult. If you skip certain paragraphs, then questions about the main idea of those paragraphs are going to be a little difficult. So, but I have to say, let, let, me, let me go back. I have to say this, and this is in support of those who teach that stupid strategy. Reading the first and last sentence may help you get to main idea questions. And that would be wonderful if that was the only sentence type on the SAT. But it's, I mean, only question type. But that's not the only. You got primary purpose questions. And we're talking about, okay, let me, uh, one second. Okay, yes. All right. Primary purpose questions. They ask us what the author is trying to do with this passage, paragraph, sentence, word, phrase. It could be any part of what the author has written. Easy, easy to recognize these types of questions. But what they're trying to ask you is, what is this word, sentence, phrase, paragraph trying to do? Is it trying to inform persuade, cite research, dispute something, give a perspective on something, analyze something. It's asking you what the author is doing with it. So when it's asking you what the author is doing, then obviously it means that th th what action is the author trying to do with this particular word, sentence, phrase. So the answer choices are usually going to begin with a verb, because it's talking about, you know, something he's doing with it, some action. And this is an easy way to identify a primary purpose question. Now, I hate to black it out because I know you're writing, but I need you to listen to me just for a second. You have to be able to distinguish between each question and what type of question it is because with each type of question, you have a certain way that you're going to go about answering it. And it gives you an idea of what you're being asked. If you have no idea what the question type is and you're confused between a main idea question and a primary purpose question, you're probably not going to get that question right because those two questions are going to ask you two totally different things. So we've got to be able to learn how to identify them and we're going we're gonna, to you know, look at some questions themselves and figure out what type of question it is. Okay, so let's move on to the next question type. How about we not? Why go back? No, that's important for us. Let's see a question first. So let's look at this question here. All right? It usually starts with verbs, and I just said this, and I'm talking about the primary purpose questions. Let's look at this question. Wolf uses the word we throughout the passage mainly to. Mainly to do something with it. This is a primary purpose question. And this is how they are asked. So it doesn't say primary purpose question and then it have the question. You have to figure out that it's a primary purpose question. You can also do that by looking at the answer choices. Look at the beginning of each answer choice. It begins with a verb. So no, now we know we're dealing with a primary purpose question. So on a primary purpose question, we're going to answer it differently than, say, a main idea question, obviously, because it's asking us something different. But that helps us to understand the question itself. What is he doing with the word the we? What is he doing with this word? And, of course, we don't know the context, so we can't, like, you know, go that far into it. But you get the idea. You, you get the idea, Ms. Jenna? Yes? Primary purpose question. Okay. They are asked... Uh, they are formed in more than one way. So, you know, as you take your practice test and you see more of these primary purpose questions, you get a feel of, it, you know, you'll be able to detect or notice when the question is a primary purpose question by how the question is being asked. Let's continue here. Okay, let's look at some more, just to give you some more examples. This next one here, the author most likely used the examples in line 1 through 9 of the passage to highlight the... So he's doing something with it. 
He's doing something with it. And then we have our answer choices. But in this case, they don't begin in verbs. And that is okay for a primary purpose question not to begin in a verb. But the question itself told us that he's doing something with this. Lines 1 through 9. He's doing something with those lines. So that's a primary purpose. The author refers to work by Camille and others in order to... So he's doing it in order to do what? Offer, introduce, question, support. Now we have a classic beginning the answer choice with the verb. So we know this is a primary purpose question. So now we can identify those. We're just looking at the questions to see if we can tell whether, it's, whether or not it's a primary purpose question. Because when you're dealing with a passage and you got questions that come after it, you have to be able to determine with each question what's, what, what you're being asked. And the best way to do that is learn the question types. You have to learn the question types. If not, every time you come to a question on the SAT, you're going to be asking yourself, okay, so what is it asking me? Instead of going through all that trouble, learn the question types and how to identify them, and you know immediately, or at least in general, what the question is asking you. And then you can deal with the content of the question. But if you ne don't even know what type of question it is, then each time you ask, ask, ask each time you answer a question, you're going to start at the beginning. What is it asking me? So you can skip that part. It's asking me, this question is asking me what the author is doing with this particular word, phrase, or sentence. So I don't have to. Now I can just go into the content, and the content, of course, is going to be in the passage itself. So I can skip all that trying to figure out what the question is asking me. Okay, this is the good thing about a standardized test. They ask questions in the same way, and it'll be forever. You just have to learn the various ways they ask you and the telltale signs of that particular question type, and you don't have to worry when you sit down to take that test. You know, a lot of stuff you want to figure out, and it saves a lot of time learning the question types. Okay, so let's move on here. Detailed questions. Obviously, the word detail tells us a lot. We're talking about specific things. And this is the word that you need to remember when you're thinking about detailed questions. Sp specificity. Specific things. Let's look at this question. The social psychologist mentioned in paragraph 2 would likely describe the dead weight loss phenomenon as. We're being asked about something very, very specific in this passage. It could be a 750 word passage. But they're asking you about paragraph 2, lines 17 to 34, and even in those lines, they're asking you about specific word and terms. So we know immediately this is a detailed question. We're probably going to answer it differently than the main idea in a primary purpose question. These are the questions that come as close as you're going to get to reading comprehension questions. Dead weight means something that's uh, worth, it's, it's worthless, but it's kind of like, it can kind of hold you back. It's like unnecessary. Okay, so, predictable, questionable, disturbing, these are the answer choices, but knowing that this is a detailed question, is asking you something specific, is very important. I want to make a last point about this. Everybody should be writing what I say down. I mean, I tell you what, I mean, you can write it down now, but I guarantee you, you're going to have to pay somebody for the information next time. Or you're going to have to buy a book or something like that and spend a couple of hours reading it. Okay, so here it is. Detailed questions. Now, this, this is an important point about detailed questions. Although they come closer to reading comprehension questions than any other question, they, you're not going to find the answer right there in the passage. So this is unlike it was a few years ago where you see the question and the answer choice and you skim the path, there it is, there it is, boom, I got a match. It's not like that. It would be the same meaning, but it would be worded differently. So just keep, keep that in mind. Detailed questions. Ask about the detail of the task is something, of course, very specific. Most like reading comprehension questions, 
that you are probably familiar with, which is probably the main idea in detail, probably the only two types of questions you, you're familiar with because you've dealt with those types of questions about something you read in the past. The other question type may be new for you, especially this one. Inference questions. The most difficult questions on the SAT. I mean, I had to say, inference questions, the most difficult. I see some people smiling in the back. Difficult questions. Why? Because the answer is not in the passage. But it is in the passage. It's not in the passage. But it is in the passage. Yesterday we talked about explicit and implicit information. Somebody tell me the difference between the two. So I can continue talking about inference questions. Somebody tell me the difference between explicit and implicit. Really quickly, yes. I thought you raised your hand. Yes. Okay. Explicit, obvious. There. Right there. No question about it. Implicit are not obvious. You have to read between the lines. And we know between the lines there's nothing. But, yes, no, there is something. You have to think about what it is. So that's what the inference question force you to think. They test your cognitive ability. And if you notice the title of the courses I have online, you've seen that word cognitive somewhere. Yes, your ability to think, your cognitive ability, your ability to, to use that brain, that magnificent thing that we still don't quite understand, the thing that's developing now and won't finish developing for you until you hit 20. And it's doing a lot of development now. It's like doing somersaults and back turns. And it's like, you know, doing the X-Men morph thing. But, you know, hey, I, I can't help you with that. Sorry, it's your brain. Uh, ask, it asks you to look deeper into what the author is trying to say. And look, not literally, but, you know, figuratively. You have to really think about what the author is saying. Really think about it. This is where the tutor is supposed to come in. With these questions, this is like the whole reason you get a tutor. So if the tutor can't explain anything to you, you're wasting your money. Because if the tutor can't help you to see what's in between the lines, then he's giving you what's literally in between the lines. What's literally in between the lines, Mr. Ackman? Nothing. <laughs> It's a, it's a joke. It's a All right, I mean, you know, anyway. All right, so these questions use words like suggest, assumption, infer, imply, and these words. So when you see these words in the question, bam, inference. You know, you have to think. You see the word suggest, the author suggests, that's it. You know it's inference. End of the day. It's not a main idea question. That's for sure. Let's see if we got one of the question types up here. Do we? Do we? Uh, yes. Let's. The passage indicates that the assumption made by gift givers in lines 41, 44 may be. And it doesn't say that it is these answer choices in the passage. So you can look at the passage all day. You won't find insincere, reasonable, incorrect, substantial, substantiated. You won't find these words in the passage. But this is what the author is trying to say in these lines. This is why it's called inference. These, oh, FYI, these are actual questions from the essay. I knew you probably knew that, but I had to say it. Uh, what does the word substantiate mean? Now, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. I don't want to pause all that. It's hard enough to get through the passages and the vocabulary and the passages. A lot of it you don't know. But let me tell you something. The vocabulary even in the answer choices is difficult. Even in the answer choices. Each test is unique, 
You will never take the same test twice. You'll never have the same question twice. You'll never have the same passages twice. So then you have to ask yourself this. If I spend two years every day taking an SAT practice test, even if you did that and you sat for an SAT, it still will be different. So how do I remedy this problem? How do I ingest enough vocabulary to make me able to deal with whatever situation I'm I, I am in? Let's say, raise your hand if you said that. Who said it? Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. And say it again. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell you right now. You can go ahead and get the book that says 1,000 words found on the SAT. And you can study all of them. Memorize all of them like you're about to take a spelling bee. You know? But I guarantee you, when you sit down to SAT, you're going to read and you'll be like, I ain't seen none of them words. <laughs> Just like that. So this is why, this is why I'm telling 10th grade, y'all need to get started today because you wasted... First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade not reading, so your vocabulary is really low, but when you sit down for this test, it's going to be really high. So you got to balance it out by starting to read now. The scheduler, the old book, on and on and on. If you don't do something right now to try to improve your vocabulary, you're going to struggle, not only with the passage, not only with the questions, well, but they have some choices too. Now, how can you answer a question? You barely understood the vocabulary in the passage. The question, you kind of squeaked by it because you saw question types. But then you hit with the answer choices. And there it is, the answer. I'm sorry. And the answer is D, but you couldn't get D because you couldn't figure out what substantiated me. I hope I'm making that's my intention. That's my intention. I want to make you afraid. I want to make you concerned. I want to make you aware. I want to make you feel like, man, this is something big that's coming. And it is coming. It's coming to everybody in this room. Hello, as of the end of second quarter, you can't get out of the American system. Did you know that? That's it. You in. It's like you locked in. You locked in. You tied in. You chained in. The whole nine. You will take this SAT. So why not make it easy for yourself? You gave me your schedule. You gave me your schedule. I'm going to be watching you. Of course, I'm not going to be watching you. But you should be watching yourself and you should be reading. Okay, let's finish about it. Do not try to answer the question based on your own thoughts. The worst thing you can do with any question on the SAT is to answer it based on how you feel at that time. No. These questions aren't based on feeling. These questions are based on what you read, so you cannot bring anything outside into that passage. You have to focus on the passage. The answer is there. There's no trickery on the SAT. They're not tricking you. The answers are there, and when you go over the answers, you'll find out, that, yeah, that does make sense. It did. It does after you find out the answer, but it did even before you found out the answer. Think about what and how the author had think about what and how the author has written what he has written. Think about it. It's all about the author, not about you. The questions are not asking you what you believe. For sure. You may not believe that the moon is a hollowed out ancient space station. But Russian scientists do and they have the data to prove it and that's what the passage is about. So you can't answer the question based on what you believe. You have to answer the question based on what you read. Focus on what the author has presented. Read the passage with a focused and open mind. With a focused and open mind. You may not like Henry Ford and his decision to only put the color black on his car. He didn't offer it in white and blue and green. He said black is the only color for his cars. So you might not agree with that. You might say, My, I like blue cars. But it ain't about what you like. It's about what the passage was about. It was about Henry David Ford and his decision to only have black colored cars. Which is actually a fact. 
He didn't believe in multicolored cars. Did you know that? You didn't know that? Henry Ford. He's the one who made the first car. Didn't he make the first car? Henry Ford. Ah, he made the first production car. He, he, he made the whole, he invented the whole idea of ma mass producing cars. So he didn't make the first car. I don't know who made the first car, but he made the first, he made cars available for the average mojo. Alright, okay, so, uh, uh, continuing on here. Tony Mood questions. Tony Mood questions. Tony Mood questions are just that. They ask us about the author's attitude towards his subject. Not asking about us how we feel about the subject. We don't like the fact that Henry, De Henry, Ford, uh, uh, Henry Ford said no, all cars should be black. We're not asking us that. It's asking us about the author and how the author felt about that. Now, if the author, you know, agreed that that wasn't a good idea, that's a different story. But the focus of these questions are asking you about how the, uh, the author's attitude and feeling towards what he or she is writing about. Tone and mood questions. Okay, and of course, you know, you are actually sometimes given answer choices dealing with specific moods. And here are some of the words down here that you need to be familiar with. There's a much better list, especially in, in prep books, that you're going to have to uh, you know, familiarize yourself with, with. So you don't have to necessarily write those, that list of words down right now. You will see a list again. Trust me. You will see a list again that you have to remember. Okay, so voc what I, I, let me get, I, I just got to get here. Just get this last, this, this one right here. Vocabulary and context. Because I have to get here. Because I made the comment earlier about vocabulary. Hello. Uh, hello. 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 Vocabulary and context. Very big part of the SAT. But these are not unique words, specialized words that you've never seen before. These are actually common words or what should be common. However, these words have multiple meanings. They have more than one meaning. So when you ask these questions, they're asking you which meaning does the author intend here. Let's look at this. As it is used in line 54, convey most nearly means. So it's not asking you what convey means. It's asking you what does it mean here? Because convey has more than one meaning. And this is pretty much how all the vocabulary and context questions. And let me tell you this. Hello. Uh, stop. 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 Let me tell you this. It's not only words. They also ask you vocabulary and context on phrases also. Words and phrases. Because some phrases are used almost all the time together. And they want to know if you know the meaning of that phrase. I guess we can stop here because we've run out of time. However, I do want to get this, this, this little bit here. I know I just said it. For those who want to like write everything down, you can write it down. But we can stop here. We will continue here on Sunday. But next week is Literature Week. And that's all we're going to talk about next week is literature, literature, and literature. I want it. Yes. Give me, give me, give me.